I have the uh, pleasure to introduce uh, John. Uh, John Harris, uh, and um, because I might uh, not be a good introducer, uh, Tommy Kushner uh, wrote this for me, and I would like to read it for you because it's like a poem in your honor, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I can I read it to me? John Harris is a philosopher with a great P of science at the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation at the University of Manchester and one of the leading and most influential public figures in bioethics. The titles of his book on human enhancement, Wonder Woman and Superman, something I, I heard of that before, and Enhancing Evolution, the Ethical Case for Making Better People, give a picture of his view on one of today's most controversial subjects. In a collection of soon-to-be-published essays honoring the work of John Harris, philosopher Jonathan Glover says, quote, the note of gleefully disrespectful dis questioning what might be called the John Harris tone of voice, is one of philosophy's important contribution to the world. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are pleased to welcome you, John. Thank you very much. I can't possibly live up to that introduction but it was a pleasure hearing it. <laughs> um, let me say that it's a great honor to be here and to have the opportunity of uh, talking to you all, not only some colleagues that I've been with all day in a very interesting meeting, but some uh, fresh faces that uh, I haven't seen in Paris before, and you're probably familiar to one another. Now, I should explain that this, um, this is a, a talk that I've only just written. I uh, was finished it yesterday, and it arises from some thoughts that floated into my mind at a meeting in Geneva a few months ago. So it is, it is new, and I should give you uh, two health warnings. The usual health warning, which as a philosopher I always give to audiences that might contain some scientists or some clinicians, and that is that I use no visual aids that were not familiar to Plato. So, uh, no visual aids, I, I always also remind you, but actually Plato did recommend the use of one very important visual aid. It was a, a deep cave and a very large fire. But most of the venues in which I'm privileged to speak draw the line at uh, lighting a fire in the auditorium and digging a cave for me. So that's the first warning. The second um, warning that I, it's not true of all of my talks, there's a lot of poetry in this talk. So uh, I, I should warn you about that. Now, the, the title will become the meaning of the title, Hot Baths and Cold Minds, Neuroscience, Mind Reading and Mind Misreading, will become clear as I continue. But really this talk is, is about mind reading, and I hope I'm going to explore with you a form of mind reading, which I think has been ignored in the neuroscience literature thus far. Much to its cost. So I hope it will be at least a new angle on some things. So, the idea, the possibility of reading the mind from the outside, or indeed from the inside, and I'll come back to introspection in a minute, has exercised humanity from the very earliest times. Recent advances in neuroscience have offered some, I think pretty remote, prospects of improved access to the contents of the mind. But a different branch of technology seems to me to offer the most promising and the most daunting prospect, both for mind reading and for mind misreading. <coughs> and this paper will tell, this talk will tell some of that story. Now, the, our story of mind re me reading begins for me with poetry. The science of the brain Neuroscience is, in part at least, in the mind-reading business. Neuroscience attempts, among many other things, 
to replace the eyes as windows on the soul. We start with poetry because historically poets have been the neuroscientists who have best understood the ways in which the mind works. And here we are concerned with hot baths because one of the greatest of all poets, Homer, used the image of hot baths as a sort of surrogate for the human condition. A condition which not only appreciates hot baths, but notices their absence and understands the wider meaning of both these states. In a wonderful and unaccountably largely neglected essay on Homer's Iliad, Simon Weil analyzes Homer's portrayal of the moral realities and ironies of human life in a memorable passage. She starts with these famous lines from the Iliad in which Andromache, Hector's wife, awaits Hector's return from battle. She ordered her bright-haired maids in the palace to place on the fire a large tripod, preparing a hot bath for Hector, returning from battle. Foolish woman, already he lay far from hot baths, slain by the grey-eyed Athena who guided Achilles' arm. And Simon Weil comments, far from hot baths he was indeed poor man, and not he alone. Nearly all of human life, then and now, takes place far from hot baths. And she might have said, for it's surely consistent with the wistful regret of both Homer and of her own commentary, that nearly all of human life takes place far from comfort or from understanding. But this passion for understanding the hearts and minds of others, even at the furthest extremity from hot baths, reminds us both of its attraction and its importance. Hector's last words as he lies dying, slain by the hand of Achilles, as far as it is uttered as far as it is possible to be from hot baths, and they take up the theme of this talk. Hector of the flashing helmet spoke to him once more at the point of death. How well I know you and can read your mind, he said. Soul searching is not identical with mind reading. Nor is mind reading identical with, even if it were possible to achieve such a thing, a complete description of brain activity. An analog here may be the relationship between genetics and epigenetics. Many neuroscientists and philosophers of neuroscience seem to me at least to be stuck in the era equivalent of the era of genetic essentialism and oblivious to the era of epigenetics and what might be its cerebral equivalent. My suggestion is that desires, motives, intentions and attitudes, and both external and first-person access to these, stand to a map of the brain or a description of brain activity as understanding the behavior of a creature, an organic creature, stands to the map of its genome. We know from contemporary epigenetics that the behavior of genes, gene expression, is influenced by the coding of the genes, but also by environmental factors, as well as, for example, being modulated by patterns of inhibitors and promoters outside the DNA that are set up within the cell and are, in some cases anyway, self-perpetuating in the way that DNA is. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein famously remarked in connection with establishing the reference of the object referred to in speech, this remark, if God had looked into our minds, he would not have been able to see there of whom we were speaking, end quote. Why wouldn't he? Why would not God, even a God, an all-powerful God, if he looked into our minds, be able, be able to see there in our minds of whom we were speaking? So if I'm talking of Homer or of... Uh, Tell me, or whoever, why would God not be able to see that fact, the, ref the object of my reference, from the contents of my mind? The answer is that it's not there. The answer, for example, to 
the question of is this act murder or is this act rape are not to be found in states of the brain. Relatedly, we have the illusion that memories are traces of experienced events, thoughts and feelings, brought to mind sometime after the experiences themselves. But while memory is pretty certainly due to brain states, two further things are not. First, whether what we remember actually happened, and therefore whether or not it is in fact a memory is simply a hypothesis. And it's not confirmed by looking at brain states. The second hypothesis concerning memory is that our memory is a recalled trace of earlier experiences, including thoughts and feelings occasioned by something in the world. But we simply do not reliably know whether apparent memories are simply memories of previous memories, which, set, which themselves involve many hypotheses about events both in the mind and elsewhere in the world. I'm going to return to these issues for a moment, particularly if probably you have some skepticism about those claims. Mind reading and the relationship between the face, particularly the eyes, and the contents of the mind, or indeed the contents of the soul, have been and remain a fascination for humankind. This preoccupation reflects a fact about us. We want to read minds, including our own. We want this so that we can understand what kind of person the bearer of that mind is, who we have to deal with, how they are likely to behave, what they want, what they are likely to do, and what they have done. And we need to know these things about ourselves quite as much as we need to know them about others. What manner of man am I? What sort of woman are you? Mind reading, if it can be done, would be a powerful cognitive enhancer, and like all knowledge, a significant source of power. The image of the eyes, I'm rather covering up mine with this piece of enhancement technology that I habitually use, the image of the eyes or the face as windows into the mind or the soul often plays a seminal role in the imagery we use to discuss the project of mind reading. Perhaps the earliest reference to the eyes as windows on the soul, comes from Cicero, who is, in the passage I'm just about to share with you, expanding on the nature of oratory, formal speech making, something I'm trying to attempt at this very moment. This is what Cicero said. The countenance, the face itself, is entirely dominated by the eyes. For delivery, oratory, the delivery of the speech, for delivery is wholly the concern of the feelings. And these are mirrored by the face and expressed by the eyes. Let's now start a more detailed investigation in the most promising place, with a few reflections of perhaps the greatest of all neuroscientists, William Shakespeare. We should not forget that one important dimension of mind reading involves reading the mind from the inside, introspection. But this is not any more reliable than any other form of mind reading, not least because of the tendency we humans have for self-justification and for self-deception. Hamlet, confronting his mother, Queen Gertrude, with the infamy of the murder of his father and of what Hamlet regards as her incest with her new husband, his father's brother, elicits this response, O oh, Hamlet, speak no more. I turns my eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grayed spots as will not leave their tink. In Macbeth, we find Duncan lamenting his inability to detect treason in one of his colleagues, the thing of Cordor, whom he has just executed for that treason. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. And in a midsummer night's dream, Helena insists, love not, love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged to keep it blind. Helena is saying that love is not interested in superficialities like beauty, which are only skin deep, but in what lies behind. Love springs from imagined understanding, 
often level, leavened with a strong yeast of hope or optimism about the nature of what lies beneath. But she also insists that only the mind can deliver the required understanding of what others are like. And this it constructs from many sources, as we shall see. I have, uh, Shakespeare was obsessed with mind reading. I'll give you one last uh, uh, quotation from Shakespeare. It's in Richard III that Shakespeare comes nearest to our present preoccupation. Richard, newly crowned but insecure, wants the Duke of Buckingham's approval of the murder of the little princes in the tower, Edward V of England and Richard of Shrewsbury, the Duke of York. Edward, being the legitimate heir to the crown worn at this moment by Richard of Gloucester. Richard is initially reluctant to spell out his murderous plans, so expects the Duke of Buckingham to anticipate his wishes, the function of all good courtiers from time immemorial. King Richard, our Buckingham, now do I play the touch to try if thou, if thou be current gold indeed. Young Edward lives. Think now what I would speak. That is to say, read my mind. It's probably correct that we are a long way now from, neuro from a neuroscientific breakthrough in mind reading. Neuroscientists in the audience will know whether this is true uh, better than I. And in particular, brain imaging and other recent developments have created expectations that, for example, criminal intent might be detectable in brain states. If this is really possible, which I personally doubt it, then these uh, neurological uh, evidence about brain states might be used as evidence justifying restraint or detention prior to any offence being committed. I served uh, for some time on a working party of the Royal Society between 2010 and 2011, which, discussed, which examined these issues through a project that it called Brainwaves, in fact one of the my colleagues on that project, uh, Trevor Robbins, was with us during the day today and has just left. We concluded in that investigation, very recent, that the case was not proven for the use of brain state evidence in criminal trials. This situation may well be the subject of future revision. Thought identification technologies, as they might be properly termed, are advancing implacably. Though in an arena so complex as the human brain, great leaps in technology may not equate to commensurate leaps forward towards our goal of reliably and clearly reading thoughts. Now, a piece of a section of this uh, talk that I'm not going to present now summarizes a lot of the uh, recent uh, neurological work on mind reading. But since many people in this audience are familiar with it, and since I have other things I want to share with you, I'll leave that out of the rest of this talk. Shakespeare, I'm not going to quote him again, but he occurs importantly in this paper, Shakespeare, perennially preoccupied with mind reading, was somewhat enigmatic himself. Facts about his life are very difficult to ascertain, perhaps because of the universality of his themes. The poet William Wordsworth, in a famous sonnet, suggests that Shakespeare's sonnets are the key to understanding Shakespeare the man. Scorn not the sonnet, so, excuse me, scorn not the sonnet. Critic, you have found mindless of its just honours. With this key, Shakespeare unlocked his heart. Here we have reached the nub of my argument this evening, and indeed the end of poetry. You'll be relieved, I hope, here. <coughs> It's in our writings and our interest in writings otherwise recorded, thoughts and actions of others and so on, that our minds can, for the moment, be best read and sometimes often misread. Life in the cloud is immortal and omnipresent and almost as replete with feelings as our own dear lives are. We must now accept that our words, and to an extent our actions and thoughts, are permanently somewhere in the cloud, in the internet. Of course, thoughts and actions are as open to interpretation as words and 
uh, other ways in which we record, record our feelings, and always uh, ambiguous. As William Empson famously remarked, in a sufficiently extended sense, any prose statement, that is, any statement in a natural language, could be called ambiguous. The cloud, the internet, is a game-changing innovation with respect to mind reading, and indeed constitutes a very dangerous state of events. Not only is it a possible restriction, not just on free speech, but on the possibility of sober or even informed or nuanced discussion, it also constitutes perhaps the final erosion of the distinction between speaking and acting, between thought and action, and indeed between thought uh, and, uh, well, we'll come on to that. This is because not only do we have no knowledge or control over who will have access to our words that are in the cloud and in what circumstances, we do not even have any control over how they will be edited, sensationalized, decontextualized, bulgarized, or otherwise distorted. Let me give you one example of both the radical expansion of access to our words and uh, indeed the dangers that accompany it. This is a story of a quotation. Let me just tell you the background. Do I have a, a roving mic? Can I walk around with this? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, my university, probably like yours here in uh, Paris and other parts of the world, are interested in what we academics do for the money that they pay us. Well, that's natural enough. But one of the things they're interested in is our impact on the wider world. And indeed, most universities these days, certainly in America and in the UK, collect data on impact. And most academics have to provide both personal and departmental impact statements. And to this end, to help us all with this endeavor, the university maintains a press, a press office, whose function is not only to advertise the university to the outside world, but to keep track of what we academics do and the impact that it has. And it is from our press office that I got the data that I'm about to share with you. It occurred because, um, I don't know if you have in France the equivalent of a very useful organization that we have in England. It's called um, the Science Media Center. Have you heard of it? It is a charity. I recommend it to all scientists here in France. It is a charitable organization set up with money from the Wellcome Trust and from various government departments as well that is entirely independent. And its business is to represent science to society. So, and, and the purpose, to, to be frank, was to combat the bad image of science through sensationalism, sensationalist journalism, so-called Frankenstein science, and all the wicked things that you scientists get up to when we philosophers aren't looking at what you're doing. Now, the Science Media Center maintains a panel of media-friendly scientists, more than 500, I believe, um, who are willing at a moment's notice to go on television or radio or to make a comment about a scientific story that breaks in the news. And I'm one of these so-called scientists. I'm not a scientist, as you know, most of you know, I'm a philosopher. Um, but I'm one of the people who they keep us to, uh, on a leash, ready to speak on any story. And I'm, the Science Media Center also publishes press releases. And they asked me for a quote on a story that concerned a drug company, Novartis, as it happens. And I gave a quote, and they duly incorporated it into a press release and put it on the wires. What I said, I'll just share with you what I said, pretty innocuous. I said, companies like Novartis should not be in a position to block moves to more cost-effective treatments in order to maximize their profits. And the press release went on to say, said John Harris of the University of Manchester. Well, Reuters put this on the wires, and the report from our press office subsequently let me know that this report had 
that the, my quote in isolation had received 31, over 31 million page views and four and a half million unique visitors. That means that four, more than four and a half different individuals access this comment online. In addition to the hits on the web and visitors to the site, what I said, this little quote, this innocuous little quote, was reported in 278 separate national and local news outlets, from news agencies to local newspapers to television stations. Now, I thought when I said that, that I might sort of be mentioned in a serious newspaper or something, or maybe in the Scientific American if I was lucky. I had no idea that what I was saying would be reported just, just that little remark so widely. And this has important ramifications. As the chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, has remarked, the fact that there is no delete button on the internet forces public policy choices we had never imagined. Recently, as many of you will know, a landmark European court ruling, as recently as May this year, on the right to be forgotten, may indeed lead to the removal of items from particular websites or local search engines. But it will not mean that the relevant data has been entirely expunged from the cloud, nor from databases, nor from computers on which it has also been downloaded. In the cloud, words and indeed images and sounds exist, as far as we know, forever, in all places and all times. This is the immortality that some have dreamed of. It also, importantly, uh, erodes tradition, the traditional distinction between words and action, and also possibly between thoughts and words. Since speculations may be taken to be proposals, and exposure of the weakness of an argument against something may be taken to be an argument in favour of it. And this gives scope for radical misunderstanding. To give you just one other personal example, I one of the many things I write about is the shortage of organs for donation. And I have been giving a talk, actually, in Manchester, in a university context, and I was defending methods of expanding the availability of donor organs by various means, including possibly paying for life donations and possibly no longer requiring consents for donations for cadavers. Pretty innocuous, tame stuff, you might think. I'm very proud of this because some years ago now, I managed David Beckham was then a famous Manchester United footballer. And in the first edition of our Manchester Evening newspaper, he was on the front page. And in the second edition, I was on the front page <laughs> with a photograph of me looking younger, darker, and more satanic, even than I look at the moment, flanked, but uh, we weren't in the same picture together, but flanked by two. Uh, very pretty blonde young women from Christian organizations, looking angelic uh, and innocent as hell. And, uh, and the headline was, this man wants your organs. <laughs> now, I don't want anybody's organs. Um, and I, of course, I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a transplant surgeon, so I don't take anybody's organs. I was just advocating um, mildly in context like this, in a long talk, about as long as this one, about 40 minutes, methods that we might consider to expand the supply of donor organs. But and I got a lot of hate mail as a result of that front page. Who is this man to demand our organs? <laughs> Without our permission and so forth. Saying that we should consider something. So, as Bruce Schneier uh, said recently in a presentation to the Royal Society, anything submitted or recorded online would be permanently in the cloud, accessible to anyone like himself, knowledgeable enough to access them. Moreover, as Schneier noted, all the research is being done on computers, and any computer can be hacked. Not most, any. Do I have time? Yes, I'll just give you some context for this um, 
this remark by Obama's um, data security expert. This was at um, a, another Royal Society activity in England, which was a two-day meeting on H5N1, the bird flu virus. And the meeting was called, because as many of you will know, two research groups, one in Erasmus University in Rotterdam and one in Wisconsin in the United States, had engineered the H5N1 virus into a new form so that it could be transmitted by an airborne route. And they had sent their papers, one respectively to Nature and the other to Science. And the editors of Nature and Science had persuaded the Royal Society to call this meeting to discuss whether the papers should be published. Because, of course, like all good scientific papers, they explain how the bioengineering was done. And therefore, a good bioterrorist with a bit of uh, biological information in a lab in his garage could re repeat this work, as indeed scientific journals expect other scientists to do, to prove that it actually had been achieved. And so the question we discussed for two days was, should this work be published in Nature and Science, respectively? Because an audience about twice as big as this, a number of Nobel Prize winners, <coughs> the editor of Science was there, the editor of Nature was there, the lead scientists on both the teams that had done the work was there, and we were discussing whether the paper should be published at all, whether they should be suppressed, or whether the naughty bits, the bits that explain how you do the bioengineering, should be redacted, is the word meant. <coughs> in English means blacked out, or deleted, and then the papers published with the broad conclusions. And we were all debating this very earnestly. There were a few, uh, a lot of distinguished scientists, as I say, a few odd people like me, philosophers who have an interest in these things. And about halfway through the second day, this guy, Bruce Schneier, who was, uh, who was introduced as President Obama's national uh, data security advisor, talked to us about how secure data actually was. And he made those remarks that I've just repeated, that nothing in the cloud, nothing digitized, nothing on a computer is secure. But the, well, he said, but we haven't published the papers yet, so there's no problem. And he looked at the two editors and he said, gentlemen, they were both men, still are, I think, both the editors of science and the editor. Science is different, I think Phil Campbell's still editor of Nature, but I'm glad that science has a woman editor now. Didn't at the time of this meeting. Um, so gentlemen, is it possible, tell me, just tell me, how are papers submitted to the journal? Could it be that they're submitted online? Yes, <laughs> well, it's too late. They're already in the cloud. And I could find them in an hour, and other people could as well. So it's too late to think about redacting them. And then you look around the audience, Nobel Prize winners, editors of these distinguished journals, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, you have made a big mistake. You look to me incredibly bored. That is your security. That is anyone's security. Make yourselves interesting, as you have done by holding this meeting. Tell the bioterrorists that there's something out there that might interest them, and the game is over. This is rather like the, you know, the, the analogy he used was a, a street of houses with burglar alarms on some of them, but not on others. Putting a burglar alarm on your house may deter some burglars, but you'll get a, if they think you've got really something worth having in there, you'll just get a better class of burglar who can bypass the alarm, probably do less damage, but they'll still get what's in your house. So, what has so far, I believe, been generally overlooked is that the existence of the cloud constitutes the most comprehensive gateway to the soul ever discovered, in principle available to all and permanently accessible. In short, whatever neuroscience manages to do in the next years, and I hope it does lots of interesting things and maybe invents other methods of mind reading, this particular method affords no effective defense, and all of us are exposed to it. We, 
I'm speaking about aspect, those aspects of our minds, my mind and your minds, that have been digitized. That is, put into computer memory or onto the internet or into the cloud. There's no defense. Anything that has ever been on a computer, let alone been emailed or stored in the cloud, can be read and downloaded if somebody has enough of a motive to do that. Now think about what data most of us have consigned to the cloud. Just think about it. Most of us now write on digitizing kit. We write on computers, tablets, phones. Most of us all write and receive emails, tweets, and so on. Many of us have a web presence, a Facebook or Twitter account, or a website. Many also keep their diaries and appointments in electronic media. Moreover, the cloud contains a record of the websites we have visited, of the things we have ordered online. Many of us, I do, fill in our tax returns online. We pay fine, uh, traffic fines and other <laughs> uh, fines online. We visit online medical services. We look up medical conditions online. We order drugs online. We order services, many of which may be unavailable or even illegal in our own countries. The list is vast. Much of this will contain the substance of what we believe on many matters. Certainly diaries do. What we are minded to do, or what we have done, or if it's a diary again, they'll contain a record of what we've done, what we consider doing, including elements of our desires and fantasies, interests, what we know and don't know, our preoccupations, our activities, patterns of behavior, of purchasing, of expenditure, what are the objects of our gaze, and more or less reliable inferences can be drawn about what sort of gaze that is. Some aspects of this are starting to arouse interest. People using the internet are becoming increasingly aware of the dangers of images and things they say on Facebook and on other websites, perhaps aided, ironically, by the proliferation of news feeds and novel forms of communication provided by the cloud. The, ri the rise of highly visible cyber-stalking applications such as Creepy. Did any of you know about Creepy? Ah, I didn't either. <laughs> One of my very bright PhD students knows about creepy. This aggregates geolocation data attached to various tweets, updates, photos and the like from any chosen poster and generates a map of the subject's whereabouts. Wonderful for people who want to stalk other people. The rising awareness of the public and the willingness to respond to the potential dangers of the cloud are perhaps well as illustrated by a recent petition against a newly announced Facebook feature, which would, quote, let it listen to our conversations and surroundings through, our, through the microphones on our own phones. At the time this petition, of writing this paper, I, yesterday, this petition had over half a million signatories. Let me end and bring some things together by one very telling example that may have even reached the newspapers in Paris. A recent news story is, I think, particularly telling. On the 21st of March this year, the BBC reported that, I quote, a woman who threw acid in the face of a friend while wearing a veil as a disguise has been jailed for 12 years. End quote. The conviction of Mary Cunha for this assault on Naomi Oni was widely reported. The victim, Naomi Oni, had been disbelieved by police. They had examined her laptop and found that she had looked at plastic surgery websites and at news features concerning another young woman, Katie Piper. Some of you may know of the Katie Piper case. She was a young woman who in 2008, as was then reported, I quote from one of the news reports at the time, was raped by a man she had met online. He then arranged for someone to throw acid in her face. Armed with what they thought was evidence concerning Naomi Oni's state of mind, the police concluded that this was evidence of her self-harming rather than evidence that she had been the victim of a malicious and vicious attack. As the UK newspaper The Daily Mirror reported at the time, 
Officers seized the 20-year-old's laptop after discovering she had viewed websites about acid burn victims before she was hurt. Now, the police in this case were guilty of an error of inference, a philosophical error, if you like, one of the most common errors to which human, humankind are subject. Moreover, the cloud simply contains data, often without context, almost always without other relevant information. For example, the cloud is irony blind contains no data on tone of voice. Often there is no context in what you find on in the internet. Remarks which may be nuanced in print, for example, or in a public statement or speech, often appear without nuance on the internet just as a bald statement. I have watched on many times when I've given public lectures like this, seeing people on their smartphones. I know that in some of those cases they were streaming quotes from me directly onto the internet because I found them on the internet or been told that they were there or they'd been reported on the press the next day. Now people like you and me, academics, often give lectures in semi-public, even if we're talking to a group of students in a seminar in our universities. We tailor what we say to our expectations about the sort of audience we are faced with and what they can cope with by way of information. And I hope my story about Katie Piper wasn't too much for people in this audience, but it was germane to the story. But these days, nobody knows who they are addressing in any context at all. And certainly, you don't know who you are addressing when you write emails or put stuff on websites or on the internet. This has, I think, been a game changer. It's true that those of us who publish broadcasts and so on place our minds to an extent in the public domain where they may be freely read by all. But most of us do so, or do so potentially, without realizing that this is in fact what we've done. Without realizing that what we say in one context may be quoted in another. <coughs> More significant by far, all people who use devices that record or transmit digitally are almost certainly placing themselves, if not on public record, at least in a universally and permanently accessible public domain. This is a domain in which increasingly inferences will be drawn, conservatively or recklessly, or anything in between, about what we feel, think and believe wish for, intend, desire, or fear. Some of the inferences drawn about us will be reasonable and accurate. And for the foreseeable future, these will constitute the best available windows on the soul. So I think if we are concerned about mind reading, it is to the internet that we should turn for the expression of that concern. <coughs> Neuroscientists in this room may disagree, but I think it'll be a long time before neuroscience is in a position to offer anything like the access to the mind and the soul of citizens <coughs> as is afforded by the internet. I want to end with one philosophical remark. In the history of political theory, at least, uh, well in fact since the Greeks, but certainly since the time of the great English utilitarian philosopher John Stuart Mill, there has been a traditional distinction between, not only between thought and action, um, but between words and action. Words being more innocuous, less dangerous than actions. And Mill, in a famous passage in his book on liberty, also makes a remark about the limits of free speech. And this is what he says. I'm paraphrasing, and I haven't brought, unlike the Shakespeare quotes, I haven't brought the quotes with me. But what he says is that freedom of speech means that you can speak your mind. It means, for example, that you can say corn chandlers, that is, people who deal in the stuff that bread is made of, corn chandlers, chandler being an older English word for seller, corn chandlers are starvers of the poor. The prices of bread means that the poor can't afford to buy bread. You can say, because it's fair comment and freedom of speech, that corn chandlers are thieves. That is within the ambit of your right of free speech. But you cannot say it to an armed mob 
outside of Queen Chandler's house, because that would be an incitement to murder. And that distinction has been pretty much accepted in liberal democracies as marking a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate use of public speech. But we are now no longer in that position. You never know which audience you are addressing when you say corn chandlers are thieves. You can't tell whether the mob you're addressing are at that moment assembled outside a corn chandler's house or whether they are sitting at home having dinner, eating plenty of bread. We don't know anymore whom we are at whom we're talking about. And so we can't employ the uh, common sense distinction advocated by John Stuart Mill of when our speaking out about an issue <coughs> is legitimate exercise of free speech and fair comment and when it constitutes incitement to some mischief, the word that John Stuart Mill used. And that is also very dangerous. It's dangerous because it means that the, what constitutes, we can't decide whether we want to operate on the world stage. We don't know whether we're going to or not. We can't decide whether we are going to make a public statement or a private statement anymore. Many of my <coughs> colleagues at the university, I, li I like talking to the press because they get a much bigger, bigger audience than even publishing in the Cambridge Court of Health Care Ethics, which, as you all know, is almost the biggest and certainly the most highly educated audience you could possibly have for bioethics. <laughs> but some of my colleagues uh, don't want to leave it there. Others of us, I also write in the public press, I also uh, speak on television and radio quite a lot because I don't know what your circulation is, but uh, if, I, if I speak on drive time radio, I get <laughs> five million listeners. And that's a decision I make. I, I choose to be a, a sort of public intellectual, public academic. But that choice is no longer open to you guys. Whether you like it or not, you might find yourselves addressing a public that you had not intended to address, would not wish to address, in and having your words abbreviated and sensationalized in ways that distort your meaning. And this, I think, is also a game changer, both for freedom of speech, because it will drive people to be more circumspect about what they say, certainly some, than at other times. Final point, so I'm talking longer than I wish. One more minute. There is a a convention in English and American speaking countries which is called the Chatham House Rules, which you can have meetings under the Chatham House Rules in which what goes on in the meeting can be reported but not attributed to any of the individuals present in the meeting. It's a way of telling people what public, uh, semi public committees are doing, what they're thinking about, but without, but doing so in a way that nobody, everybody can feel in the meeting free to speak their mind knowing that the word, particular words or attitudes will not be attributed to them. And that's been a convention that pretty much has held true. I've often been at meetings which have operated under Chatham House rules. But you never know now. You never know. And so my conclusion is that if we are interested in and worried about mind reading, the internet provides a way and the cloud, an even bigger way, of accessing the mind, sometimes with disastrous misconceptions, like in the case of Miss Oni and uh, others, uh, but sometimes they might get us right, but in circumstances where we did not intend to say this for public consumption. We all say things in private that we would not say in public. Even me. Though perhaps less, because I'm very fond of saying outrageous things in public, gets people going. But that is no longer, that's out of our hands now. That's out of our hands. And I think the effect on, on both public and private life has not, is incalculable. Not because it can't be calculated, but simply because we just do not know how to cope with it. And people are not really catching up with the scale of the problem. I hope, because I'm fascinated by neuroscience, that there will be reliable and interesting ways of reading minds developed through uh, imaging of various sorts and in other ways. But for the moment, 
we do have other methods, and they're much more intelligible. They need much less esoteric skills than being a neuroscientist. They're much more like the bioterrorist who might, in his back garage, be trying to bioengineer H5N1 to make into a terrorist weapon, because scientists exercising their usual uh, practices submit their work to peer review. That's how science progresses. And peer review means that it's published, and what's been done in that work is also published. So I think it's going to affect more and more the way people do science. I don't do any science. I just think about it. It's going to influence the way people behave. And they are going to find that things are known about them and that they become public in various ways. And their thoughts, their habits, what they read, what they look at, what they buy online, will be available not just to some, but to any, anybody who wants to know. Now, it's not all bad news, because most of us are bored, and that is a security. Nobody really wants to know about my personal life, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but they just might. Somebody might give somebody a motive to do that. And the same with everybody. But it also means that we cannot tell our patients that their digitized records can be kept confidential. We can hope that they will be. We can put in the equivalent of burglar alarms on the house and security measures. But we can't guarantee it. Though very often, hospitals and medical staff do promise to keep these things secret, but they, these are not promises that can reliably be kept. And people should know that. It may influence the way people consult medical practitioners, uh, volunteer for science research and so forth. So it's much less interesting in a way than hard science, wet lab science, the sort of science you do in this building. Um, and we need that because it's our hope for the future, it's our hope for finding out not only the treatments for dangerous diseases, but our hope for the survival in the long term of our species, and if not our planet, which we know can't survive indefinitely, but at least our ability to continue existing maybe on other planets. You may think you've got a long time to go. Normally the death of our sun is estimated in, what is it, something like 700 billion years or something? Quite a lot. Um, Stephen Hawking has recently speculated that actually it must may be quite much shorter than that, maybe only a thousand years. Not because the sun will die in that time, but because unless we do something, we would have rendered our planet uninhabitable by other means in that time. So we need science. We need science to feel free. We need science to have peer review. We need the freedom to communicate on the internet and so on. How are we going to manage it? Well, that's a problem for you guys. Thank you very much.